Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. This is the seventh video in the playlist covering all of inflammation and immunology. If you missed the previous videos in this section, you can click on the Stomp on Step 1 logo here to be taken to a list of the available videos in the playlist. This specific video is going to cover the various types of vaccines, the mechanisms by which they work, and give examples of each type. So we're going to be talking about things like conjugated vaccines, killed and activated vaccines, live attenuated, and passive immunization. We will start with passive immunization, which you can see here in the top right corner. I only give a high yield rating of 1 on a scale from 1 to 10, so it's not super important for step 1 but I will take a second to discuss it here. Passive immunization involves delivering preformed antibodies to the individual at risk of infection. You're taking the humoral immunity from one individual or animal and transferring it to another individual who's at risk. It has an instant effect as the immunoglobulins are preformed and the body doesn't need to waste any time trying to figure out how to make antibodies of its own that are targeted at the pathogen. However, passive immunity has a short duration of action because it only works for the lifespan of the transferred antibodies, which is usually about a few weeks. There are natural examples of passive immunity, specifically with infants. The breast milk has IgA that is transferred from the mother to the infant to give them mucosal immunity. Similarly, IgG is transferred from the mother to the fetus through the placenta. Through these mechanisms, an infant that does not yet have a mature immune system can be protected from pathogens. Purified antibodies made from horses are also treatment options for tetanus, botulism, and rabies. So you expose a horse to whatever pathogen you're trying to treat for, you take that out of their blood and purify it, and then you can give it to humans as a way to treat. And in most cases, you're using this treatment after a person is exposed to the pathogen. So this is sort of a last minute thing. Once you realize somebody's already starting to show some signs of one of these diseases, you give them this passive immunization because it works really quickly. Following an infection with one of these organisms, a traditional or active immunization is not an option because it takes too long to start and the patient could die by then. Now we can discuss active immunization, which is the focus of most of the immunization questions. In fact, anytime you're not specifically talking about an example of passive immunity, you can just assume they're talking about active immunity, which involves helping the hosts make their own antibodies against the pathogen of interest. It takes longer to start working than passive immunity, but its effects are more potent and can last for much longer, many, many years in fact, instead of weeks. The rest of this video is going to cover different types and mechanisms of active immunization. Through the activation of the adaptive immune system, our bodies have immunologic memory, which allows us to react much faster and with a higher potency the second time we see a particular antigen. This works really well for relatively benign pathogens. For example, if you get a cold once, then your immune system will be better at fighting the causative pathogen the next time it's exposed to it. However, this trial by fire method doesn't work well for infections that have significant morbidity and mortality. We need a prophylactic way to prime the immune system and prevent the initial infection from causing problems. Vaccinations or immunizations are the way we gain immunologic memory without having an active infection. This involves exposing the patient to an antigen on the pathogen of interest in a way that is not dangerous. This dress rehearsal lets the immune system sort of practice fighting the pathogen in a situation where the patient isn't actually infected. After being exposed to the epitope present in the vaccine, the patient will react much faster and with greater potency if they ever actually see the real pathogen. One type of active immunization is a live or attenuated vaccine. It involves giving the patient a small amount of the living pathogen you are trying to immunize for, which will initially seem counterproductive. If you're trying to prevent a pathogen, why would you give that pathogen to somebody else? And that's where the process of attenuation comes in. 
Attenuation is the process of altering a pathogen to diminish its virulence. For example, you can take a pathogen and grow it outside of a human host for many, many generations so that it adapts to a non-human environment. When you take that pathogen and put it back in a human, it no longer has the adaptions it used to thrive in a human environment. These attenuated pathogens can grow inside of a patient, but they grow very slowly and they have lost their ability to cause disease. These attenuated pathogens, although they've lost some adaptions, look very similar to infectious pathogens that cause the actual disease. So the immune response against the attenuated pathogen will work against the real pathogen should the host ever become exposed to it. The immunologic memory induced can last for decades with live attenuated vaccines, meaning that you don't need booster shots as much as some other vaccine types we're gonna talk about later. The immune response to live attenuated vaccines is also very strong. It's because the live pathogen can induce more types of immune response, including humoral immunity, mainly IgG, mucosal immunity, IgA, and even some cell-mediated immunity. However, there's one big drawback to the live attenuated vaccines, and that's because you're giving a live pathogen, there's a chance that through mutations or adaptions, that live pathogen can revert back to the infectious form. It is extremely rare, but it's possible that this attenuated virus or bacteria can go back to the original form and cause the disease. Here's a list of the most important examples of this type of vaccine for the USMLE Step 1 exam. The MMR vaccine treats for measles, mumps, and rubella, and those are examples of live attenuated vaccines. There's the Sabin vaccine, pronounced like Nick Sabin, but spelled a little bit different. And that's going to be for polio, and this is the oral form. It's not used in the U.S. much anymore because the mutation issues where it can very rarely cause polio in the person you're vaccinating. But it's still used in some third world countries because it can be given orally and therefore is a lot easier to distribute even if you've got poor healthcare infrastructure. Then there's also the varicella zoster vaccine or the chickenpox vaccine. The other major class of vaccination that we're going to talk about involves giving a patient a pathogen that has been killed with heat or formaldehyde. Now, if we're talking about viruses, you can't really kill a virus because it wasn't alive, but it still fits and it's easier to understand it that way. These dead pathogens still have surface antigens that are recognized by the immune system, creating an immune response. However, compared to the live attenuated vaccines, the killed and activated vaccines have a relatively weak response and the response is much shorter term. It's not going to last for decades, it's going to more last for years, meaning you may need some booster shots. And while IgG is generated against these pathogens, you're generally not going to have a mucosal immunity or cell-mediated immunity, which is why the potency is lower. The question is, if it doesn't last as long as it's not as strong, why would you ever use this type of vaccine? And the big caveat is that it can't cause the infection. The live vaccines can mutate back into the actual pathogen, but since these pathogens aren't alive, they can't do that. So you have almost no risk with this if the vaccine was prepared correctly. Here are the most important examples of this type of vaccine. You'll have the Salk vaccine, which is also for polio, like the Sabin, but this is the injected type. This is the one that's more commonly used now. You'll have the rabies vaccine and the pertussis vaccine. There are versions of the influenza vaccine which are killed and activated, but there's also other types of the influenza virus vaccines that don't include full dead pathogens. They include just fragments of the pathogen. A toxoid is a bacterial exotoxin that has been inactivated with heat or formaldehyde. So it's the same way that an inactivated killed vaccine would kill the full pathogen. It's just now you're treating just the toxin and not the full pathogen. This heat or formaldehyde removes the toxic effects of the toxin so that it can be given in a vaccine without causing the disease. 
This type of immunization creates immunologic memory against the noxious toxin instead of the pathogen itself, which is relatively innocuous. Toxoid vaccines are available for tetanus and diphtheria. The DPT vaccine, or Tdap, is going to have toxoid vaccines against diphtheria and tetanus in it, as well as a pertussis vaccine that is not a toxoid. Toxoids are proteins that are highly immunogenic, and that fact can be used to our advantage for other types of vaccines called conjugated vaccines. The reason toxoids are so immunogenic is because they're proteins, and proteins can activate T-cell-dependent immunity, unlike carbohydrates. What we do is we covalently bond a carbohydrate antigen to a toxoid to create vaccines that work better. A carbohydrate, such as a fragment of a bacterial carbohydrate capsule, is not immunogenic enough to create a strong immunologic memory and an effective vaccine. But if you connect a carbohydrate antigen to a protein toxoid, the T-cell dependent portions of the adaptive immune system will be able to recognize it better. This method of combining a carbohydrate immunogen with a carrier toxoid protein is referred to as conjugate vaccine. Using this method, you can create vaccines against the polysaccharide capsules of bacteria like type B H flu and Neisseria meningitis. That is all I have about vaccines. Now I'd like to take a quick moment to mention that running Stomp on step one takes a lot more money than you probably realize because we have to pay for things like recording equipment, recording software, and web hosting. If you'd like me to make more of these videos and continue to release them for free, please consider clicking this green button here to make a small one-time donation with either PayPal or a credit card. Unlike similar study aids that charge hundreds, I'm releasing this material for free. I don't want to leverage students' test anxiety for a profit or contribute to your debt. However, I'm a medical student just like you, and I have six figures worth of loans of my own. So I can't continue to fund the project on my own on top of the hundreds of hours of time I'm dedicating to the project. If you'd like to watch the next video in this series, please click this black box here. It will cover the different types of immunodeficiency. Thank you so much for watching, and good luck with the rest of your studying.